Kia ora koutou. Um, lovely to be here today and to have the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, when I was asked to speak uh, about um, something interesting on design, I kind of thought, oh gosh, what's going to appeal in a public lecture kind of forum? And that got me thinking not just about the research that I do, but what we do as designers as well and the role that we play in helping to shape people's relationships with the information that they're presented with on a daily basis. And that's where I came to the realization that this is largely what we do as designers is about helping to shape people's perception of information. So this is done through um, a range of ways. Um, it's about designing the interactions that we have and shaping um, the large number of, I guess, types of media um, and ways that we interact with those media. It's about facilitating people in their curation um, as well. Um, and it's about creating that visual presentation. As we have moved through history from the early um, oral and pictorial um, forms of information, the computer has played an increasing role in the shaping of the information that we have around us and the ways that we interact with it. So this development of computing has meant that the types of interactions we have with information are mostly digital on a day-to-day -day basis. That the curation of that information has shifted from being in the hands of a few to being in the hands of many. And the digital presentation of information has also shaped the way we design that information and present it to people. So the other three strands that I'd like to pick up on tonight when talking about information, the way we design it, and the role that it plays um, in our lives. Because the quantity of information that we're now presented with on a daily basis almost seems insurmountable to be able to consume all of it. Yet the time we have to be able to consume that information feels like it's constantly diminishing. And the quality of that information, well, I think there's some quality information out there still. It's just a case of discerning what that quality information is from the quality, well, information that lacks the same amount of quality. Um, and so that's a bit of a conundrum that we have. And the decisions that we're trying to make in terms of what we consume in the time we have and making good decisions that will be useful to us is often informed by the presentation and design of that information that's in front of us. Sometimes it can be misleading, but largely well-designed information is often information worth reading. So in the curation of information, we started historically that information was largely shared orally, uh, sometimes through pictographs, um, and this moved to being written in books, then printed in books, and that then moved into digital media. And the holders and the people who decided what information was passed on kind of became wider and wider as history progressed and the forms of dissemination of information changed. So orally, the information was often held by a very small number of people. And this increased slightly as we started printing um, in books and disseminating books and printed information. 
and then the explosion of digital media and the World Wide Web has now meant that information is in the hands of essentially anybody who can use a computer. Um, and who decides what should be shared? Who decides what we should be consuming? Um, is no longer held by a few, um, but is held by many. And we get that time versus quantity dilemma of the fact that when there are so many people producing and disseminating information, how do we decide what we read, what we consume, and what we don't? The development of digital media has also changed our interactions with information. It's no longer a one to many, and now has developed into something that's more of a conversation. Something where people can contribute back again, as well as just be given information to. It's moved from a very linear progression of information, so spaces such as oral storytelling or a printed book move through in a very linear manner. You turn the pages and one follows another. The development of things like tables of contents and indexes in books changed that linearity slightly in that it made it easier for people to search and consume the information within those traditional linear media in a much more informal, interactive kind of way. And then digital media has changed that again, to the World Wide Web literally being a network of ideas, um, sometimes very heavily connected, other times bits kind of just floating out the side there. Um, and so now as creators of information as well, we can't guarantee that someone will come to our information having read a particular part beforehand or having prior knowledge. Um, and so the way that we also present information now becomes important because it influences people's understanding of what information is important and maybe what is worth consuming um, because we are also now given thanks to digital technology we have an overwhelming number of ways of presenting information. This is things like typefaces moving from you know, a few um, different typefaces only a few fonts in metal type to having, um, you can now generate typefaces using AI. And so there are so many that are available to us, it becomes almost overwhelming. Um, either the design of information or the non-design of information and being able to discern whether something's worth, worth reading um, or worth not reading. Presentation though shouldn't be a barrier to whether something is good information or not. Good quality information should be accessible to all. So I want to focus not just, not on, there are so many aspects to the visual presentation of information. Visual information is incredibly important, but what I want to focus on is the presentation primarily of textual information. So the sorts of information that we would read um, and consume um, in um, forms that are traditionally print um, or digital media. The way we present text changes our perception of the content. But design can help people and it can help to shape people's perception of that content. So what it can do is it can help people with making curation decisions because text that is well designed in theory um, is more likely to be credible information. Text that was published in books had traditionally been through a process of having an editor 
and having a publisher and making sure that that content was up to a certain standard to be able to be worthy of publishing that many copies at that cost. Now in a digital era, information is so easily published that we now need to consider whether the way that the information is being presented is credible or not. The curation decisions we make are also tied to helping us decide whether the information that you are being presented with in this moment is the information you're actually looking for. In this time poor society that we live in, quite often we need to make decisions quickly about what that information is that's being presented to us on this web page or in this journal article or on this blog post or whether it just be a social media post. But understanding whether the information that's being presented there is what you're looking for uh, quickly and easily can be facilitated by the quality of the design of that information. The design of the information also is cha changes the interaction decisions we make. Will it mean that we quickly click away because it doesn't actually seem that interesting or it doesn't seem like it's going to be easy to read or is this a link that's clickable that will take me to more information about this specific idea that I want to know more about so just that design of a link having a blue underlined word can be the difference between someone finding the information that they want or not and in a world where so often we are scrolling through information and scrolling through screeds of information sometimes, it's trying to encourage people to make good decisions through the design of that information about whether it's worth their while to read or to keep scrolling. Is this a point in the information that I want to stop and read what I've found? or should I keep going? The interactions that we're having have, with information have changed significantly. The knowledge that we are now presented with isn't presented in the same strictly linear fashion. Um, often that context that we are so used to having by having a book with a table of contents and a cover page that can introduce that information to us uh, isn't as readily available. And there are different kind of design signals that we need to give um, to help people understand whether they want to interact with this information or not. The context that people have coming into that information before they get to where they currently are is often a lot less known too. Um, our attention spans are shorter. We are far more likely to just go with doom scrolling. It's become an absolute habit of many people today is to just scroll infinitely. And the job of a designer can be to help stop that scroll, presenting information that will stop people and take a bit more notice of the content that they're looking at. The digital worlds that we are working in though also pose new options for interaction with the information we're presented with. Um, we can change information on the, on the spot as the consumer of information as well. We can change the way it is presented to us in some situations. I know that my husband has his phone type set on like the largest setting that he can only fit like three words on the screen. Uh, I, I swear he's not an old man, he's only in his 40s, but seriously, um, I'm pretty sure he's yeah, holding it like this too. Um, so people can also make really bad design decisions about their information as well. So when we put information presentation decisions in the hands of an individual, um, sometimes they make great decisions with that information. Yeah, other times it's questionable. Because the perception that each individual has of information is very, indiv very 
individual. People come with either poor eyesight um, or a font they particularly love or a format they're more used to and all of these things play a part in creating information that is um, appealing to an individual. So I think there's no silver bullet, there's no perfect way to, prevent, to present textual information to people. But there are things that we need to be aware of as the creators of content and the people who are sharing content. Um, there are things we need to be aware of in order to be able to make at least some inroads towards information being easy and accessible. From some research I've done, I found that designers definitely see things differently. Um, mainly just that we, we sort of see space more than people who um, aren't trained as designers. There's probably a lot more to be unpacked there than the, than the first kind of research study that I did. Um, but interesting to know that different people see the information they're presented with in different ways. The example um, to the right there um, is actually just a screenshot from the ACM news email that I think I get every week. It feels like every day, but it's probably every week. Um, and I noticed when sort of scrolling through this information um, that just the way that it's been presented definitely makes it easier to scroll more quickly through that information. With the titles of the articles being blue, with <clears throat> the authors and their institutions being darker and bold underneath, although I may have done that the other way around personally because the bold kind of stands out more than the blue. I questioned this, but you know, the, the thoughts there, they've put some intent to trying to make this um, less of a, a doom scroll and more of a people actually intentionally consuming the content that they want consumed. Then, you know, a bit of a blurb after that and a button. Um, the button, I, as a designer, the space there really bugs me that it's the same, there's the same space above the button as below it. So I'm actually not certain whether it belongs to the information above it or the information below it. But knowing that the first one came after the first lot of text helps that. But I shouldn't have to question that. But anyway, other things that um, are really important to understand when people are consuming text um, and the different perceptions that individuals have is that people are actually far more likely to get lost when they're scrolling through text. They don't know where they are, how far through am I? And we used to have this great little scroll bar down the side, but I've now noticed that quite often this scroll bar just kind of endlessly moves down. It gets to a point and then it's no longer an orientation cue to help you know how far through this endless scroll of information you are. So what used to be a really functional visual tool for us has been destroyed. Um, bring that back, please. The other thing I've found through research is that people who read slower need to be considered a bit more. People who are fast readers, we can, I'm not saying we have, to, we, we should pay less attention to the visual design, but they're more tolerant of design that's not as effective. But people who are slower at reading need a bit more structure and a bit more help. And so individual perception and individual differences and accounting for those when we design and present information to people um, is really important. So one way that we can help improve the quality and the accessibility of information um, in especially these kind of scrolling type situations is to use a bit of emphasis. So like I showed in that last image with the um, ACM email with all the news bites, um, they've used emphasis to help assist people to pull out the information that will help them make decisions as they work through that process of deciding whether each individual item is worth reading. So using things such as bold to highlight the headings will help people with reading them as they scroll through. Um, blue maybe wasn't the best option, but bold was good. We can go with bold. Um, changing the typeface is a good option as well. 
Increasing the size, need to increase it enough, more than 20%, but not too much, any more than kind of 40% and you've like completely killed someone's flow. Um, quite often capitalization is used. Um, many journals use capitalization. Um, a lot of books, um, especially from more traditional publishers, use capitalization for pulling out use um, headings. Um, Capitalization is actually not the best option if you want people to be able to read it quickly. Um, and italics seems like a great way of emphasizing things too, but people generally just tend to think that that's kind of within the text um, and something that should be within the flow of what's being said. Oh, did I choose a bad typeface? Is that hard to read? Sorry, I probably should uh, choose something more appropriate for the situation because typeface choice matters as well. The options that we have now seem to be endless. Um, from, like I said, having just um, a few options of different fonts to choose from, um, to set um, through to now having what feels like an endless supply that is sometimes curated for us by the systems we are using. Um, and other times, uh, as we search um, the internet for new inspiration, um, a seemingly endless supply. Quite often we have a favourite. Um, I know I certainly have favourites that I gravitate towards, um, but it also depends on the situation too. Um, quite often though, people just use the default. Sometimes, that could be a good option because for many people there's the old adage of we read best what we read most. And so lots of people are very comfortable reading Times New Roman. Um, I'm not saying I'm a great fan of Times New Roman, um, but it is something that people quite comfortably read. Um, or if you're familiar with using Adobe products, we usually give Myriad as a default, which, yeah, different situation again. Um, and so we can scroll Google fonts, we can find new amazing typefaces that have been curated in some way because they have had to jump through hoops um, to be able to be listed as a Google font or we can go to any number of um, terrible websites where people can upload their own experiments um, through to now there being options where you can use AI um, to design new typefaces with new parameters. So who knows what um, completely illegible um, experiments will come out of that. Um, but when presenting text to be read, clarity is important, the ability to distinguish the letter forms and understand um, the difference between a B and a D, the difference between an O and an A um, assists people with knowing what the information is that's in front of them. Context is also important. Understanding who you're designing for and who's likely to be consuming this information um, are also really important things to consider um, in the development of what you're creating. Because typefaces have personality. They are like images that help to bring the content that they are presenting to life. They're like people. We love some of them. We may not like some of them as much as others. Um, they each tell a story and they each have uh, a different way of showing their face to the world. Some of them are outgoing and bold and will steal a show, and others of them are quite happy to just sit back and relax um, and enjoy being in the corner and just hold on to their little piece of content in case someone wants to come and consume it. And so thinking about the context in which you are using a typeface is important. Is it a single short word where you can express something in a flamboyant and interesting way? Are you expressing it to people who are very set in their ways? Or are you expressing it to people who are um, more open to experimentation? 
Is there a need for it to feel a certain way? A typeface can take people on a journey back in time. It can make people feel a certain sense of time and place as they read the words that a typeface has been printed in or been presented in on a screen. So considering not just what the words say, but the message that the typeface they're printed in delivers to the people that are reading them. Once we get past the typeface, we need to think about what makes people read on. What will make people want to continue to consume the content that we have? And that's a challenge these days when we have so much content that is being presented to us. If we are presenting content that's easy for people to consume and easy for people to read, will that help increase their interest in the content if it's presented in a way that is easy for them to be able to understand not just what they're reading, because it's a clear and legible typeface, but also understand how far through this information am I? Remembering what's come before and knowing the context of what they're reading about. Also, when we're scrolling, ads, ads, more ads. Sometimes I think there's more ads than content. Um, I know I certainly get frustrated and just give up sometimes, even if the content's great, the ads just make me move on. I'm, just, I'm done with this, can't deal with this. Other. It's the same ad over and over again sometimes too, which is even worse. So carefully considering like what we do in the presentation of information will often shape whether people will read on or not as well. Because here we have two passages of text, kindly generated for me using um, AI, but um, this is actually the same passage of text both times. One of them feels, despite being longer, a lot more approachable, a bit easier to read. Um, it also feels a bit more accessible with the fact that I've got some different examples in there of ways of drawing out people's attention to get them reading and understanding the content that will follow. So first up, that first line, those first few words, are actually slightly larger than the rest of the content, and they're also bold, which draws our attention there and gives us a sense of what the content is <coughs> that follows on from that first few words. At the start of that second paragraph, those, that first line is in bold. It's the same size as the rest of the text, but it helps to draw us down to that. So if we were searching not just for the information that's in the first paragraph, but looking for the information that was in the second paragraph, we'd be able to find that content more easily. And then uh, as we get further down, um, in that second to last paragraph, it's getting harder to see, but there's some text there that's capitalized. Not as easy to see doesn't draw our attention as well. And maybe we want that subtlety of highlighting some information, but not enough that it jumps out of the page at somebody. Uh, and lastly, in that final paragraph, um, there's actually a few words that are italicized. Again, really not, e not as easy to see. And people see italic italicized text uh, as being text that is just slight emphasis of something that's in the run of prose. But we can see by just comparing these two paragraphs with, or these two passages of text, one with paragraphs and one without, all of a sudden the text just feels a whole lot more accessible. So simple changes that we're making help to create a more accessible passage of text and hopefully means that someone reads past the first couple of lines and consumes the content that we're presenting for them. So information design matters. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just looking at text-based information. The way we design the information that we're presenting to other people, whether it be in a short 
printed piece of information through to a long digital article. The way we present it would form and change people's opinions of what we're showing them. Will they scroll on? Will they flick past it? Or will they stop and at least read what the title is and what the heading is in the hope that they might actually consume a bit more of that information? And what will keep them consuming that information? If they start, how do we keep them reading? How do we keep them consuming? If they're searching just for a small snippet of information, how do we help them scan that text? How do we present that information in a way that makes it easy to scan, easy to see the content, and easy to find what they're looking for? If they've scanned that information and found what they're looking for, will they then read on? Will they consume that information on a deeper level? And once they consume that information, will they understand it? Because the way we present that information can also help people understand it on a deeper level. And because of the typeface we've chosen, because of the spacing and layout choices we've made, how will they feel about that text? Will it have made them feel really anxious and they just want to get out of there because it was just all a bit too much? Or will they feel really satisfied and relaxed and comfortable with having consumed that information? So the choices that we make shape the choices that the consumers of information make. Those of us who are making those visual presentation choices for information in this digital age are helping to shape people's curation and decision making and what they will choose to read. Because there is so much out there, there is so much to consume that we need to help people choose wisely in order to fulfill their information seeking needs. We are now designing people's perception. Thank you very much. I am happy for questions if people would like to ask me anything. Yes? Um, years ago when I was looking at um, web design and page design, mm -hmm. somebody said, however many fonts you think you're going to need, get rid of pretty much all but two. Yes. Um, is that still uh, true today? Because I know as you said, um, a variation of typefaces. So what? Yes. So. Yeah, absolutely. I would absolutely agree with that advice. Um, but often it's really useful to have a secondary typeface. So you've got the main typeface that you've got for the body um, and the majority of your text, but having a second typeface to be able to use for headings or to emphasise text will often be really useful. Um, so quite often as well, if we have uh, a serif typeface, such as Times New Roman for the body copy, or Georgia or um, another type of um, serif typeface for the majority of the text. Having a sans serif typeface you know, um, like that will stand out and look stylistically different, but fit nicely in terms of a similar kind of proportion to that main typeface will help to create those points of emphasis for people. Um, so you'll often notice that um, you'll have a sans serif typeface for the headings when you'd um, to have that contrast with um, the body copy of the text. Yeah, but yes, keep it keep it simple. Definitely. Yes. So as a designer, you know designers. Yes. What's your free rule? Ooh. Right? As I go home, what's yeah. the right the designer said to do? Keep it simple. Use more space than you think you need. So between the lines and around the text. Um, so increasing the amount of space between those lines helps to make it a lot, lot easier to read. Um, 
And my third piece of advice would be to, oh, maybe I need to do some research to find out what the best three pieces of advice are. Um, I would say use emphasis. So create variation because when it feels monotonous, that's when I think you're going to lose people too. Um, and it'll also help people kind of keep oriented within the text as they're reading through. So, yeah. You're welcome. Yes. You said that people with um, concentration spans, I should say. Do you mean all people or some people? I think it's in general. I think also it's a generational thing too, maybe, and it's most people. It's not everybody. Um, but I think we're often, we've got a lot going on around us, and so it's maintaining people's attention too. You know, um, I think it's certainly a very different situation if I am uh, sitting at home with my book where there's no phone next to me, where there's no one, in theory the kids are out, um, when there's no one going to disturb me versus when I'm in my office, I've got my screen, I've got books, I've got 16 tabs open, I've got my phone next to me, oh, yeah. and there's lots of different points of information that are demanding my attention. Yeah. Might be able to concentrate task, but I think, yeah, we're in situations where there are more distractions and more things that are competing for our attention. And also I think when we're in these spaces, especially digital spaces, where there's the opportunity to navigate away from the content, that changes the way that we interact with it too. When we're in a novel, it's linear and we are you know, less likely to go, oh, I wonder what that link takes me to and wander off to there. Whereas on a web page, even if it is kind of a longer article, you'll often find that there are links that will take you away. Even on, in a journal article, we can click away to a reference. And while we might be you know, reading in a sustained way that article, we then go, oh, actually, that's a really interesting point. And you leave the thing that was really interesting and follow that, that new trail. So, yeah. Maybe we're just more distractions in our lives. Mm, absolutely. Fair enough, yeah. Mm -hmm. How much do you automate GPT? Have you tried ChatGPT? I haven't asked ChatGPT for a solution to this. Um, interestingly, I used ChatGPT to get that text, and I asked it four times, I think, please give me some text about text. Um, and so it gave me four paragraphs of text about text. Um, I think the hard thing, and I'd be interested to talk to you more about this, would be that paragraphs need to stop at kind of a logical point and whether ChatGPT would be able to understand where are the logical points to break. Because there, yeah, no, I'd be interested to know. Yeah, it'd be great to know. Um, so there is some research out there that says that the frequency of a heading should be approximately every 400 words for easy searchability of non-fiction text. Oh. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, the social media is on different time types. Yes. Yep. Like 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 Absolutely. But there's also then that problem of, I've, just, I've experienced this with reading journal articles in that Yes, you do. You want them presented in different ways in print compared to screen as well. And starting to read an article, which I'm, I swear I've never read before, because it looks different to the other version, and even different repositories have different visual presentations of the same article, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, so yes, there are definitely things that you should do differently in different media to make it... Yes. It's not horrendous. Um, there's definitely some improvements that could be made. 
um, but there's a lot worse out there. Um, they chunk information reasonably well, although I do find that the line length is exceedingly long for the amount of space between the lines. Do you often find when you're reading an article that you get to that end and then you can't find the top start of the next line? Yep, so smaller, shorter line length and more space between the lines would help people there. But, you know, yeah, so there are design improvements that could be made, absolutely. Yep. You're welcome. Ralph. Um, we talked a lot about the tag Yes. Um, how does color fit in? Yes. Oh, okay, this has taken me back a long way in my research now. Um, <laughs> I did a type uh, and color combination. I started and did something for like my honors. But um, so the contrast is what's really important. Um, so people need. Um, adequate contrast between the text and the background, whether it be black on white or white on black, or greys or creams, or um, it's um, also some research that um, we did with, Nick and I did with some people at education a long time ago, feels like a million years ago now, um, looking at um, children and their ability to read and correct themselves um, changes with different text and background colours, but um, you do need adequate contrast, but it doesn't need to be black on white or white on black. Yeah. And there's another question over here, was there? Yep. Um, you mentioned that the text was actually, you know, the design of the text was about the decision. Now, does that mean that something about more of the design of the text? Is yes. Is there a way that you can book emotion, let's say calming versus something that, yeah, Yeah, to an extent, um, partly there'll be content too. Yeah. You know, like a headline can make you angry, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but definitely there are like subtleties that will change people's kind of emotional response. So text that is much heavier and darker and larger in a very solid sans serif typeface is going to have a, a stronger, more aggressive feel to it than something that is... Uh, a thinner, uh, more balanced serif typeface. So yeah, you do have kind of different feelings to to what these typefaces kind of bring out in you. And you know, and obviously coming back to the question about colour, if it's going to be red, you know, there are kind of connotations that. Although then you have to be a, very conscious of the different cultural connotations of different colours as well. So black isn't necessarily always. A negative colour and red um, isn't always a colour about anger. So, yeah, cultural context matters too. Yeah, yeah. May, did you have a? Yep. Yeah, um, background images. Um, yes. Back in the early days of the web, I remember every web page seemed to have like <laughs> printed on some sort of textured paper or yes. sort of effect. That seems to have disappeared in more recent years, or am I just not looking in the right places? No, yeah, it's disappeared, and that is a great thing, <laughs> by and large. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We also don't get music when we open someone's MySpace page anymore, which is also good. <laughs> so there's, um, yeah. So that also the the use of textures in the background plays into that idea of contrast between the text and the background, um, and ensuring that there's good readability. Um, so often when you have a texture in the background, you've got more variation uh, in kind of the intensity of that colour, which then makes it potentially more difficult to read. Hmm. But if you're going to do it, something subtle's you know, potentially okay. Tricky, but yeah. Okay. Let's thank Claire again for the and in looking ahead and actually acknowledging that we are in July already, even though you might not have known that this is not the design month, That's this is actually Cybersecurity Month. So Friday and Saturday we have the Cybersecurity Challenge for the tenth time already and lots of very interested people in breaking cyberspace will come to the university 
and be already registered. And uh, we have later this month, we have Vimal Kumar will talk about cybersecurity. Um, I don't have the date for that one yet. And then August will be machine learning and AI. So we need to hold on to Bernard's question because yes. the talk on the 7th of August uh, by Albert is about chat GPT and other things. <laughs> and we can then go back and actually say, right, so can chat GPT actually do some proper design of presenting the information? Yes. Um, that one will be presented over in Taranga. So that may be the opportunity to think, do I want to spend a day in Taranga? Hmm. 7th of August, ChatGPT, Weka, and uh, AI Institute, and Waikato. Okay. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you.